Hello everyone, I am Dr. Lakshmi Gayatri. In this video, I am going to discuss about the gross anatomy and the clinical anatomy of the submandibular salivary gland. Why is this gland much important? Because it contributes for about 60 to 70 percent of the saliva secretion of our mouth when it is not stimulated. The submandibular salivary gland is given the name because it is present below the mandible. That is why it is called as submandibular salivary gland. This gland also has one more importance. The calcium formation is more common in this particular salivary gland. Why? Because of the course of the submandibular duct. The duct passes upwards and backwards first and then forwards and upwards. The course of the duct and also the secretion of the submandibular gland is more viscous and it is a mixed gland. So the viscosity and the course of the duct will contribute for the stagnation of the secretion and that is why the calcium formation is more common in this gland. So because of this reasons, this gland is very important to be known. So let's quickly go into the discussion. The gross anatomy of the submandibular gland can be studied under the following topics. First, we have to know about the location of the gland. What are the basic characteristics of this gland? The different parts of the gland and how it is related to the other structures? Also should know about the submandibular gland duct, then its blood supply, nerve supply, the lymphatic drainage and finally its clinical anatomy also. The submandibular gland is a content of the submandibular region which extends from the submandibular fossa in the inner surface of the body of the mandible to the hyoid bone. It is also a part of the digastric triangle of the neck. The submandibular gland is one of the three paired salivary glands while the other two are the parotid and the sublingual glands. It is a mixed gland whose secretions are predominantly serous in nature. It is walnut shaped in appearance and its weight is about 10 to 20 grams. And these are some of its basic characteristic features. Parts of the submandibular gland the mylohyoid line which is present on either side of the inner surface of the body of the mandible gives the origin to the mylohyoid muscle which gets inserted into the hyoid bone. Along the posterior border of this mylohyoid muscle, the submandibular gland sweeps and forms two important parts. One is the superficial part which is present outside the mylohyoid muscle and one present which is deep to the mylohyoid muscle that forms the deeper part of the submandibular gland. Hence the gland has a superficial part and a deeper part. Now let's see about each part. The superficial part of the submandibular gland which is present outside or lateral to the mylohyoid muscle presents two ends and three surfaces. The two ends are anterior end and posterior end and the three surfaces are inferior surface, lateral surface and medial surface. The anterior end of the superficial part extends forwards and is related to the anterior belly of the digastric muscle which is present superficial to the mylohyoid muscle. Similarly, the posterior end of the superficial part is related to two structures. One is the stylomandibular ligament. The other one is the cervical loop of the facial artery which is lodged in a group. In case of stylomandibular ligament, one end is attached to the styloid process of the temporal bone while the other end is attached to the angle of the mandible. This ligament is responsible to separate the parotid gland which is present posterior to it and the superficial part of the submandibular gland which is present anterior to it. Surfaces of the superficial part Coming to the under surface or the inferior surface of the superficial part of the submandibular gland, from the external to internal, it is related to skin, superficial fascia, which contains the skeletal muscle, platysma. Undercover the platysma, it is related to the common facial vein formed by the union of the anterior branch of retromandibular vein and the facial vein and also the cervical branch of the facial nerve all are present here. Still deeper to the superficial fascia, the investing layer of cervical fascia splits at the level of the inferior surface of the gland to form two layers. Hence, the relations of the inferior surface are from external to internal are the skin, superficial fascia, platysma, 
Inner to platysma are the common facial vein, cervical branch of facial nerve and the deep cervical fascia. In addition, inner to deep cervical fascia, the submandibular lymph nodes are also related to the inferior surface. The orientation of the superficial part of the gland is present between the myelohyoid muscle and the submandibular fossa of the body of the mandible. So hence, the superficial part is medially related to the myelohyoid muscle and laterally related to the submandibular fossa of the mandible. Now let's see what are the other structures related to the lateral surface of the superficial part. Posterior to the submandibular fossa of the mandible, a muscle named medial pterygoid muscle which is one of the muscle of mastication is getting inserted into the inner surface of the ramus of mandible. Also, the facial artery which, is, which was present in the posterior end now gets winded around the lower border of mandible to enter into the face. Hence, now the lateral surface is related to the submandibular force of mandible, medial pterygoid muscle and the looping of the facial artery. The relation of the medial surface to the superficial part is very important. It is divided into three parts the anterior, intermediate and posterior part. Anteriorly, the medial surface is related to the myelohyoid muscle along with its supplying vessels and nerves. The hyoglossus muscle lies deeper to the myelohyoid muscle. The intermediate part of the medial surface is related to this hyoglossus muscle along with the lingual nerve and the submandibular ganglion which lies superficial to the surface of the muscle. The posterior part of the medial surface is related to four important muscles namely styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, posterior belly of digastric and the middle constrictor of pharynx. Also two cranial nerves namely glossopharyngeal nerve and hypoglossal nerve along with the lingual artery. So this completes the relations of the superficial part of the gland. Let's talk about the deep part of the gland. This deep part is present between the myelohyoid muscle and the hyoglossus muscle. Just see this picture of hyoglossus muscle. It contains the lingual nerve, submandibular ganglion and below the hypoglossal nerve. The deep part of the gland rests on the hyoglossus muscle between the lingual nerve above and the hypoglossal nerve below. Hence, it is easy to understand its relations. The deep part is laterally related to myelohyoid muscle medially to hyoglossus muscle above to the lingual nerve and below to the hypoglossal nerve so that completes the relation of the deeper part also submandibular duct otherwise called as wharton's duct it is 5 cm long this submandibular duct begins at the middle of the deep surface of the superficial part of the gland after it arises it passes forwards between the myelohyoid muscle and the hyoglossus muscle its course is first upwards and backwards and then forwards and upwards and finally it opens in the floor of the mouth on the sublingual papilla which is present on either side of the base of the frenulum linguae in the undersurface of the tongue. During the course of the duct, the lingual nerve is intimately related to it. At first it lies above the duct, then crosses on its lateral side and finally winds to reach its medial side. So, Above lateral and the medial is the triple relation of the lingual nerve with the submandibular duct. The submandibular gland is supplied by the branches of the external carotid artery namely facial and lingual arteries and drained by the corresponding veins which in turn empties the blood into the internal jugular vein. The lymph is drained into the submandibular lymph nodes present in the inferior surface of the superficial part. The submandibular gland is innervated by both parasympathetic nerves and the sympathetic nerves which are both secretive motor in nature that means both help to increase its secretion but the parasympathetic stimulation creates or produces a watery secretion while the sympathetic stimulation produces a sticky mucus secretion that is why this gland is said to be as a mixed type of gland. What is secretor motor innervation? It is a motor supply given to the smooth muscles of any gland which helps to bring out the secretions.
The secretor motor supply usually has two types of knobs. One is preganglionic fiber, the other one is the postganglionic fibers. The preganglionic arises from the nucleus or the ganglion present in the central nervous system, while the postganglionic fibers arises from the peripheral ganglion. A word about submandibular ganglion. It is a small fusiform peripheral ganglion which belongs to the parasympathetic system. Topographically or physically, it is connected to the lingual nerve through two roots, an anterior root and a posterior root. But functionally, it is connected to the facial nerve and its caudotymphanic branch. The parasympathetic secretomotor innervation for the submandibular gland arises from the superior salivatory nucleus present in the pons which gives out the preganglionic fibers. These fibers passes through the facial nerve, the caudotymphani, and through the lingual nerve it enters and relays into the submandibular ganglion. The submandibular ganglion gives out the postganglionic fibers which passes through the anterior root into the lingual nerve and finally innervates the gland. The sympathetic nerves arising from the superior cervical ganglion on reaching the gland winds around the facial artery to give the secretomotor innervation and also the vasomotor supply. Clinical Anatomy of the Submandibular Gland The submandibular salivary gland is the most common site for calculus formation. This condition is usually rare in other salivary glands. It presents as a tense swelling below the body of the mandible. The swelling can be palpated by bimanual examination between a finger in the floor of the mouth and another finger below the angle of the mandible. The size of the swelling is increased during meals and it is reduced between the meals, which is diagnostic of this condition. Xylography is the investigation of choice for calculus where radio-opaque dye is injected through the terminal opening of the duct and the duct system can be visualized through x-rays. Another condition is the enlargement of the submandibular lymph nodes which usually occurs due to infections of the scalp, face, maxillary sinus or the mouth cavity, the most common cause being acute infection of the teeth. It is usually mistaken for the swelling of the gland itself. Tumors of the submandibular salivary gland is also not uncommon. Excision of the submandibular gland is usually done for the tumor in the gland or for the calculus in its duct. The skin incision is made 2.5 cm inferior to the angle of the mandible to avoid injury to the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. That completes the discussion about the submandibular salivary gland. Thank you.